Hello everyone, the Green Scorpion here, and this time, I'm pairing up. Hello everyone, this is Blaze Knight, and I'm happy to be on the channel. I don't know how many of you guys know this, but I kinda like Fire Emblem. It's one of my favorite video game franchises, and thanks to a few Let's Plays and a couple hundred rants, it's now one of the series that I'm most associated with. Yeah, I can relate. While I've dabbled in other franchises, Fire Emblem is the one I'm primarily associated with. I've been mulling around the idea of some dedicated Fire Emblem countdowns for years now, and I was watching some of Blazing Knight's channel, which is full of incredibly thorough rankings of Fire Emblem characters. And listening to him break down all the members of the Blue Lions or the Church of Saros, I knew he'd be the guy to help me organize my thoughts and finally write this darn thing. So we got on Discord, reached support class A, and worked out this little video you see today, the top 15 laws of Fire Emblem. I think you mean this big video. We're going all in, folks, because there's a lot to consider when ranking the main character of each installment. Should we rate them based on their writing, their development, their stats, their usefulness in game? Yes. yes! I spent the better part of 10 years covering the series as a whole, so I believe I'm in a relatively good place to discuss the entire birth of this franchise and its ever-changing cast and mechanics. And both of us have a lot to say about the stories they tell. All you really need to know is, this is our opinion, based on a lot of criteria and speculation, a fraction of which we'll have time to tell you today. To help streamline the selection, we ended up grouping specific lords together, as we wanted to include just about everyone, though we'll still discuss them individually as much as possible. And bear in mind, their placements don't necessarily reflect our views on the lords individually. This is more so a middle ground we decided on when it came to our collective thoughts. This was a huge undertaking and you won't agree with all of it, but feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. For us, getting all of our ideas down was about as difficult as American Radiant Dawn. No stone unturned, no chest unopened, no village unvisited. Except for Fire Emblem Engage, which is still a new title and we still need more time to get acquainted with it. Either way, feel free to take a break partway through, maybe watch a dancer to regain your stamina. Oh, you don't have to tell me twice. <laughs> I hope you have some vulneraries handy, because these are our Top 15 Fire Emblem Lords. If you're familiar with either of our channels, then you should have an idea of which Fire Emblem games are our favorite, and which ones not so much. And you can probably guess which Lord we put on the bottom. But Corrin is the best character you don't even know! Shut the fuck up, Joe! It's no secret that I'm not the biggest fan of the Ocean's Grey Waves, whom I find to be incredibly bland at the best of times. War tends to bring out the worst in people, and in Fire Emblem Fates' free branch storylines, I was privy to witness three inconsistent yet equally terrible aspects of this multinational misfit. In Conquest, I shall admit that during this pathway, I felt that Corrin had the most substantial amount of growth due to actually contemplating the choices they made, though much of that is marred down by the fact that Corrin spinelessly clings to the ideal of reforming their father while thousands die in the process. In Birthright, they're so by the numbers and basic I barely even remember what they're like, even in the game's most dramatic moments, and concerning revelations, Corrin's naivety becomes downright unbearable as they're constantly being betrayed by obvious backstabbers, which their siblings excuse as a strength of the character rather than a weakness, despite calling him out about it all the damn time. Worst of all is how the lives and personalities of the entire army seem to orbit around Corrin like a wayward moon. You'd think Camilla and Ryoma would have more to talk about rather than who loves Corrin more, yet here we are. This only seeks to highlight how flat Corrin is, but despite all these misgivings, thanks to their appearance in the spin-off titles, I can't bring myself to outright hate Corrin. Well I can. Corrin is the linchpin of everything that doesn't work about Fates. Take the shoehorned inheritance system. Intelligent systems couldn't think of a way to add kids without time displaced deep realm bullshit, and didn't consider how this made every parent in Fates the worst parent ever. Corrin worst of all. They effectively abandoned Kana for most of their life, which is especially egregious when you consider Corrin was locked away as a child himself, and is doing the same thing to their own child on a cosmic scale and fails to tell Kana about their dragon powers until it's too late. Whoops! I know it's just an excuse to have this mechanic, but if I'm supposed to take these characters seriously, then I'm going to take their actions seriously. Also, Corrin, darling, why don't you wear shoes? I know it's a nitpick, but no one has ever given me a satisfying answer. Is it because they're a bastard child who are traditionally barefoot? Well, that's no excuse for going barefoot on the battlefield. Is it because of their dragon powers? Well, why wasn't that a thing for Tiki or Murr? 
all you needed was one line in this overly written game where Corrin is maybe like, well, Garen never allowed me to wear shoes and now they just don't feel right when I wear them. That at least would have been fine. But no, the game refuses to justify what's basically a fetish bait design choice. And another thing. Okay, I'm gonna take the reins and let Oscar cool down a bit before he burns this place to the ground. Corrin does have some positives, as having essentially a monarchy as your main unit is very unique, as is the design of Corrin's dragon form. I would have liked to see more unique abilities than just being tankier and using Dragon Fang, but hey, that's what Smash Bros is for, and regardless, they're incredibly useful. Corrin's versatility as an avatar is complemented with an even spread of numbers on all fronts, and since everyone wants a piece of that dragon tail, Corrin can class change into just about anything. There's a lot of fun to be had when building them, and if all else fails, their personal weapon the Yato is incredibly powerful with its various father slaying forms. When looking beyond Fire Emblem Fates, Corrin's positive traits I find to be far more prominent in the likes of Fire Emblem Warriors, where their focus lies in acting as the moral support instead of the center of attention, and allows their naive optimism to help bond with their fellow teammates and be an uplifting presence during hard times. That's the long and short of it, but we've got to get a move on. So Oscar, do you have anything positive to say? Yes, actually. Despite my overwhelming complaints, I do agree that Corrin is a much more palatable character in the spin-offs. As a matter of fact, their place as a supporting character emphasizes my point that Corrin should not have been the main character of Fates. Make them important, certainly, but time has proven that they are not protagonist material. Honestly, Azura should have been the protagonist of Fates, but due to the writers wanting their favoritist dragon child to be the focal point of Fates, this leaves Azura in the dust where she is criminally underutilized. But that's going back into complaints, so I'll stop myself there. Bottom line, Korin has a remarkable amount of potential for something amazing, and I truly wish that potential was realized. And yeah, I'll admit, Fem Korin is pretty. Well, he's not wrong, and Fire Emblem Heroes certainly took this to heart. I guess Corrin is better seen and not heard. Eleven, twelve... Hey Blazing Knight, how are we gonna fill 15 spots? There aren't enough games. Warriors. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, and so did Intelligence Systems. Rowan and Liana, or the Lemon Twins as I like to call them, are the Prince and Princess of Atollis, and Koei Tecmo's original characters. To put their own original spin on these Fire Emblem protagonists, Koei wrote Rowan to be an exuberant battle-ready protagonist, and Liana to be his caring and compassionate womanly foil. That doesn't sound original at all. That's basically two anime archetypes in their most generic formats. Yeah, you see the problem here. And to make matters worse, Rowan and Liana have to share this game with past Fire Emblem Lords who do all of these tropes better, and are far more interesting to us by nature of having appeared in other, better written games. Despite the uphill battle, they're serviceable as protagonists, but my expectations for this game's plot were low to begin with. You can see the character growth these two require from a mile away, making their story arc as predictable as Laszlo is horny. I tend to prefer Liana of the two, that is to say, nothing about her outwardly bothers me, and she's admittedly very sweet. Roman's interactions get so repetitive it numbs my mind. I get it, you're hot-headed, you want to get stronger and eventually become a knight, can you please change the record? Annoying as he may be, I must commend the Sour Patch Boy for having an overall stronger support chain than his sister, particularly this time with Xander that delves into their shared daddy issues and anxiety about the future. Good stuff if you ask me. They're also rather fun to play as, though obviously we can't judge them by the same metric as any of the other Fire Emblem Lords in their RPGs. They both have swords because lol Fire Emblem, and they like both the mobility advantage of Xander and the flair of Lin or Olivia, but they do have access to staffs which allow them to support the army for multi-pronged missions, and their promotion and the corresponding sacred weapons help them to do dragon loads of damage. They don't really have anything as far as gimmicks, but they are the main characters, so it's expected of them to be somewhat reserved. They still have big attacks, great coverage, and pretty rad Musou abilities. I just wish they had a better proving ground than Fire Emblem Warriors, a game that doesn't even hold a candle to the Hyrule equivalents. But that also leads me to judge them less harshly. Compared to a character that I hate leading a story that I expect it to be great, I'm fine with a couple of average characters leading an average story. I expected a bit more flavor from the citrus, but what can you expect when the whole drink is bland? Why are we even talking about this game? Because if we fail to cover all the bases, somebody's gonna bust a blood vessel. You know what? Fair enough. Oh yeah! 
just like a knight. Thirteen, fourteen. Knight, we're still short one game. I thought we weren't doing engage. Fire Emblem Heroes. Okay, seriously? We're just obligated to cover every facet of this. Fire Emblem Heroes! Did not mean to do that. Yeah, it's the other Fire Emblem game that isn't actually a Fire Emblem game. Although I think it's fair to say Heroes does a pretty good job distilling the complex battle system into a chewable tablet for mobile play. My 500 plus hours of playtime would agree with you. Were we to have written this list during Generation 1, I would have placed Alphonse and Sharina firmly at the bottom of the barrel, for the Lords of Asuka seem to be in the same vein as the Lemon Twins regarding writing, with Alphonse being just a little less yellow and a little more mellow. Fortunately, as the years went on, Heroes has given much appreciated development to their original characters, the Asuka nobles especially as Book 3 acted as a significant turning point for Alphonse, not only delving into his complex relationship with his father, but also pitting him against his evil doppelganger from the Hot Topic timeline and proving his metal in outsmarting Death herself. I also gotta give credit to Alphonse for being a deceptively dirty player. Seriously, Books 4 and 5 have him pulling schemes that Claude would be proud of. Too bad Sharena hasn't gotten the same treatment. I love this girl. She's cheery and loves meeting all the champions from across the franchise you can summon, making her much like me while I'm playing the game. But as we creep through Book 5, its clear intelligent systems is pushing Alphonse center stage, while Sharena is meant more to support him. I still can't imagine the game without her, but she's definitely second fiddle. Kind of fitting that, mechanically, there are many ways to build Alphonse and Sharina, but when looking at their generic kit, I find that Sharina works best as a support or tank, whereas Alphonse prefers to function as a DPS unit. They're both basic bitch builds, but with good HP and no truly terrible stats, not to mention weapon refinements for Folk Vanger and Fenselir bestowing bountiful bonuses. There is an inevitable problem with this, however. Power creep. Heroes is an ever-evolving meta, and Generation 1 units have no chance against the likes of Hegemon Edelgard, Queen Veronica, Astrid somehow. I know that the idea is that they're residents of this world summoning heroes from infinity other worlds, but the problem is you can't summon new Alphonses or Sharenas, meaning that you can't merge them into plus 10 units, which is all but required for high level play. Maybe we can include the New Year's Alphonse and Sharena? I mean, they're pretty good, even by dual unit standards. Yeah, but then we'd be obliged to consider the hero's variants for every other character on this list, and ain't nobody got time to talk about Lynn and her army of alts. As is, Vanilla Alphonse and Sharina have their merits, but struggle in anything but the most favorable of matchups in a game of enough power creep to render the weapon triangle meaningless. They have their merits, but as it stands, we can't reasonably put them any higher. Fortunately for us, the rest of this list is mainline Fire Emblem characters, so we can stop comparing apples to oranges. And lemons. So with the spin-off characters out of the way... Well, I guess there is Tokyo Mirage Sessions. Honestly, I don't know where to begin with Itsuki. Nothing against him, but I also have nothing to say, and Tokyo Mirage Session is very different from the Fire Emblem norm, and not just because of the anime factor. So, honorable mention? Honorable mention. Well, with the spin-offs out of the way, along with the obvious punching bag, we can finally start the list in earnest with the lord who started it all, Marth. You know, the Super Smash Brothers character. It's fair to expect that an 8-bit game that came out in 1990 didn't have much in terms of characterization, but Marth actually has quite a few appearances to consider. He's the protagonist of both the first and third Fire Emblem game, which originally came out on a Famicom and Super Famicom respectively, both of which were given full-on remakes on the DS, though the latter title never left Japan much to my dismay. Katarina deserves so much more love. And the former title is honestly the most boring title this side of the Pacific Ocean. I have to keep reminding myself that I've even played it. Well, despite the assumption that this would make Marth as bland as Marshmallowless Lucky Charms, I personally love Marth in his debut game. This poor kid loses everything in a matter of in-game minutes. His kingdom, his family, his friends, especially with Shadow Dragon's gut-punching decision to make you, the player, decide who stays behind to die. Brutal stuff! As emotionally devastating as this is to Marth, he forces himself to go through all of it. 
never succumbing to despair and only taking the luxury of remorse on a single occasion, all the while he's learning to be a great commander and a greater king, even if the actions required don't allow him the luxury of peace of mind. But not so much a great unit. Marth has nice stats and decent growth rates, but Shadow Dragon's design philosophy holds little value for these numbers, instead favoring class lines and forged weapons. Being locked to swords, Marth will have trouble with most of the game's enemies, and if you don't force yourself to feed him kills, not even that rapier will get you the damage you need on key targets. He is special in that he's the only character in the game who can visit towns, but all future lords can do that. Heck, most future characters. So all that does is create situations where you're forced to risk his safety. Marth spends much of this game as a walking lose condition. Now, now, Oscar, that's all in Shadow Dragon. New Mystery of the Emblem is an entirely different affair, where Marth has become a true hero king. This DS remake gave him some sizable stat buffs, and the rebalanced design of the game makes those numbers actually matter, and the higher amount of enemy variety means that it's not so bad that Moth happens to be sword locked. There's plenty of Axemen to kill, having super effective damage with the Rapier and Falchion is a tremendous boon, plus the Binding Shield gives him plus 2 to all stats even if they're capped. Moth finally reflects his reputation in the merely competitive scene. Oh, certainly, he's way more viable in the sequel, but he also loses that subtle characterization from the first game that you liked so much. Or more like, he started over? It's like the writers didn't know how to make a Fire Emblem game where the hero's not a naive princeling, so Marth makes a lot of bad calls unbecoming of the King of Altea, like falling for Hardin's long and drawn out betrayal as if this was still his first rodeo. I'm pretty sure thieves can't promote in this game, so why the character assassination? I think the better question is, why so critical? I'll admit, Moth's writing takes two steps back during New Mystery, especially regarding the stuff with Lang, but it's far from a butchered characterization. Even so, I can't justify putting him any higher than number 12. I will admit though, Marth was a good start to the archetype, the foundation that all future characters are built on. I'm just not giving any special treatment to older characters. Equality for all, huh? Edelgard would be pleased with your approach. Eh, we'll get to that later, but for what it's worth, the franchise wouldn't even exist without Marth. That has to count for something. What can I possibly say about Lee from Fracia776? I don't know, what? Not a whole lot, actually. At the time of this recording, I haven't played Fracia yet because... Well, to be fair, most people haven't because Nintendo refuses to localize it. I only played it with the help of some... unpromoted berserkers. Care to take the lead on this one? Gladly. Just take all this with a grain of salt, because this is going off of fan translations. So, you know characters like Ross, or Donal, or Mozu? Units that start pitifully weak but have awesome growth rates so you can mold them into late game killing machines? Leaf is like that if he were the main character. Kind of. He was actually introduced in Genealogy of the Holy War during the second generation part of the game, where he starts out terrible but can eventually promote to a dangerously versatile Master Knight. But Thracia takes place before Genealogy's Part 2, so to keep continuity, Leaf starts out even more terrible, with the potential to become... not nearly as good. Yeah, I'm looking over the stat sheet, and they leave a lot to be desired. Poor starting values with average growth, He's sword locked and foot locked, and his promotion comes painfully late in the campaign by the looks of things. Adept is nice, but that has you relying on lucky rolls for a character who really doesn't want to play risky. It's not all bad though. With Leaf, you get as much value as you put into him. And you need to put some value in if you're going to survive this game's broken difficulty curve. I'm looking at you, Reinhardt. Using your scrolls on Leaf can help him get on his feet in the early game, and later on, the maps start throwing out enemies that Leaf actually has an advantage over. Even if you hit the level cap early before promotion, Leaf can be a helpful support unit just by standing around, as a generous number of characters in the game can build support with him. Finally, you get the King Sword, which is not only shiny, but gives Leaf the Charisma ability, granting him plus 10 accuracy and avoidance to all of his friends in a 3 square radius. And, being one of the only units immune to Thracia's fatigue mechanic, Leaf can be that fulcrum to maneuver your army out of some sticky situations, which Thracia is full of. I've witnessed my fair share of players claim that Leaf is a useless liability, who dies in one hit. And similar to Marth, it's annoying to have your lord be one of the squishier units. But from what I can tell, 
Leaf is incredibly unique as far as Lords go, with his emphasis on local party buffs, so long as you invest in him in accordance with the game's mechanics. It's unfortunate that Fraser more or less forces you to adopt this strategy, but I appreciate the novelty. So how is he as a character? Well, if I can sum it up in one sentence, this kid needs a therapist. Like Marth, he lost everything, and he has a similar fire to get it all back, but in Leaf's case, he's much harder on himself for his failures. You can tell Leaf harbors ongoing trauma from the fall of Leonster. He questions his ability to lead constantly, and is hesitant to open up to other people as if he's afraid to gain new loved ones that might also die right before his eyes. This kid has a major case of PTSD. Still, this darkness fuels him more than weighs him down, and he never stops trying to improve. He's a dumb kid protagonist, but he knows that, and he's always willing to rethink his sophomoric approach to things. I just wish the game had more time to really delve into Leaf's issues, but there's just a lot going on in Thracia. And like Corin, your opinion on Leaf might be affected by the game he's in. Thracia is notoriously brutal, so a hero with more experience and better stats might have really helped players wade through all that bullshit. Instead, we got Leaf. By no means a bad lord since, if trained properly, he's actually very useful, but I don't envy his position as the star of what many consider the hardest game in the franchise. Just barely cracking the top 10, we have the sacred twins Erica and Ephraim. Taking clear inspiration from Fire Emblem Gaiden, Sacred Stones gave us two protagonists that spend most of the campaign apart in order to explore a continent-spanning conflict. Yeah, I have a bone to pick with that! Don't you always. You pick more bones than a vulture. Look, I like Sacred Stones as a story, but the way it does its split storyline is a pet peeve of mine. The first third of the game you spend mostly with Erica while Ephraim's off revengeancing, and the whole time they talk about how much they miss each other, and once they're finally back together, they immediately split up again, and you can only follow one of their stories. You could just make a save file before you have to choose a route. That way you can skip the beginning third and see each respective second act. Yeah, but then it won't carry over the same stats from my army, and it just doesn't feel right. Every playthrough of Sacred Stones feels like it's missing a few puzzle pieces because of this. Well, if this game is all about being separated, why don't we separate the Lords for this entry? We each take one. Alright, dibs on Erica. Dibs on Erica. Oh. Well, Alright then. Erika is definitely the more balanced of the two from a writing standpoint, subjugating the role of a prim proper princess, unsure of her abilities and in way over her head when Grado invades her homeland. Her highness quickly finds her strength not just in swordsmanship, but in making friends and forging alliances. Erika always prefers peace over violence, but has to come to terms with the realities of war, that not everybody is satisfied with their fair share, and many people don't deserve her patience or mercy. But it's that patience and mercy that ultimately makes her more fit to rule in my eyes. Absolutely agreed. Ephraim's more of a straightforward, avenge my father kind of guy, and by the time Erika's process Grado's preemptive strike, Ephraim's already knee deep in enemy territory kicking ass and taking names with his best cavaliers. Ephraim has to learn the opposite lesson to Erica in that not every problem can be solved with a lance, and even those that can often shouldn't. But man is it a good lance! Ephraim's story route is easily the weaker of the two, but it includes confronting King Vigarde. You know, the guy who attacked your homeland? And reveals the true villain behind the scenes to be Vigarde's son and the twin's old friend, Lion. Why you always lying? Yeah, I know it's pronounced Leon, I just wanted to make that joke. So, yeah, I think Leon being the mastermind behind all this is kind of an important thing to cover on a standard playthrough. As for viability, Ephraim's kind of a beast. He's got a very balanced build with generally great bases and growths, plus access to javelins and spears, not to mention Reginleaf, which decimates everyone it touches and the horse they rode in on. Once he gets a horse of his own, he's not the best rider in the game because, you know, Seth exists. But he's the Renee sibling I want watching my back. In comparison, Erica is a little lackluster in terms of stats. I tend to think of her as being a slightly better Lin. Excuse me, you got something to say about Lin? Oh, I do, but we're not quite there yet. In relation to Erica, both herself and Lin have similar bases and undependable growths, while also starting sword and footlocks. But not only does Erica eventually horse up and much earlier to boot, which completely shits on Lin's bow usage in the game that treats them worse than Kamoshida treated on, Sacred Stones doesn't hate sword wielders the way Blazing Sword does. Yeah, well, counterpoint. Shut up. 
fucking fanboys. My point is, unless you really feed her in the early game, she'll fall off eventually, and both siblings have little to specialize them in a game full of great characters who can wield multiple weapon types, wear armor, and fly. Plus, whichever route you choose, the other hero is going to show up in Chapter 15 looking pretty underleveled, so if you want them to survive the final stretch, better make your way up the Tower of Valny. Be that as it may, they may be lacking as individuals, but Erica and Ephraim shine brightest when they're together. together. You know, in hindsight, that was really lame. Yeah, well, so are these flashbacks, but I admittedly like them. Ragging on each other, training together, or just wasting the day away, the story does a really good job making you want these two to get together again. And the same applies to Leon, which makes his role as the villain all the more heart-wrenching. It made me nostalgic for an earlier time that I wasn't actually present for. If we rank these two individually, I don't know if they'd have made it this high up. But as Sacred Stones intended, the siblings balance each other's flaws to make a particularly proficient pair of protagonists. Which is why the game should have just let you play both routes in one story. Seriously, they did it in Gaiden, do it here! At number 9, we have Fire Emblem's golden boy Roy from The Binding Blade. Another game Nintendo has yet to localize, but one that I've actually got around to playing. Alongside Marth, Roy represents many Western fans' first exposure to the series thanks to his appearance in Super Smash Bros. Melee, which actually came out before Roy's Fire Emblem title. I like Roy a lot in Smash Ultimate, being a small but impactful variation of Marth with an amazing uppercut for his jab that lets you combo into- Hey, remember, we're only sticking to the games they're the lords of. Oh, right. Though I understand the love for his Smash interpretation, this is ultimately unfortunate as I don't feel Roy lives up to the hype elsewhere. Acting as another example of the young, fresh-faced Lord, Roy follows many of the same beats established by the likes of Marth and Seleth, and to the lad's credit, there's nothing about Roy that actively annoys me, from a writing standpoint at least. For the love of God, why can't you dodge? There's just not a lot to his character in my opinion, other than him being a good, often resourceful commander, and quick to make friends whom he will immediately risk in permadeath warfare. Not even his support conversations do much for his personality, barring how he inspires his comrades. I always felt there was a lot of wasted potential regarding Roy's character, and Binding Blade in general. The game explores a lot of dark subject matter, from Eden's broken soul, the constant betrayal from fellow countrymen, and the main villain Saphil being the product of horrible people he grew up around. Roy could be seen as a foil to Saphil and reflect the theme of nature versus nurture, as a young lad who surrounds himself with reliable people, and as such becomes a source of light in the world, which comes full circle by sparing Idun. But many of these themes and ideas are barely a footnote throughout the game's script. Maybe if Merlinus didn't interrupt every fucking conversation, we could get some meaningful dialogue. I find I have a higher opinion of Roy in this regard, due to some of the subtler choices in the script, but I admit that that might be subtext or even just my own headcanon projecting onto the game. Yeah, I've seen your Let's Play. You headcanon a lot. Guilty as charged. I see Roy as perhaps a more inspiring leaf. Horrible stuff happened to him, he acknowledges it, but he's determined not to submit to sadness. He also has the optimism of a child that gets him into trouble sometimes, particularly a drive to save everyone he possibly can when that's just not possible, which I think describes a lot of people playing Fire Emblem. Trying to recruit everyone, keep them all alive, and visit every village before it gets burned down by brigands. Well, if you want brigands defeated, you've come to the right boy. Roy is a big help in much of the early game with its overpopulation of axe-wielding enemies and its strict adherence to the weapon triangle. Having a sword gives him reliable hit rates, and the rapier he wields allows him to take on armors and cabs. But once the Western Isles and to a lesser extent Arcadia is over, Roy falls off harder than Persian in Gen 2 of Pokemon. It's quite a parabola, isn't it? Even at level 20, Roy's stats just don't get the job done until you can promote him all the way in Chapter 21. Then Roy gets the titular Binding Blade, and the game breaks completely. This sword is a monster, buffing Roy's defense and resistance, working as a consumable healing item, giving him ranged attacks, and incinerating anything that crosses Roy's path. It's so good, it's stupid. While I think Roy's reputation of being useless until late game is a bit of an exaggeration, this is truly the most ridiculous power spike in the series. And though it is a lot of fun to rampage through the remaining chapters with your thousand degree knife, that's not because Roy is strong, but rather his sword is busted. Yeah, as such, we can't justify putting Roy any higher than this, but as long as we're doing the hard-to-protect main character thing, at least the Binding Blade gives us a cathartic payoff. BURN, BABY!
question. Does Makaya count as a lord? Ansa? I believe so. I think she does too. Sure, she's not the typical royal baby with a martial weapon, and at no point is her character class Lord, but she is the main character of her game, for a while at least, and she classes up based on story progression, it's an automatic fail if she dies, and she ends up leading a country. Introduced as a counterpoint to Ike from Path of Radiance, Micaiah is the main character for Part 1 of Radiant Dawn, which sees her squad, the Dawn Brigade, living in the ashes of Dayan, left behind from the last game. Meeting Lakaya and her friends provides a disconcerting new perspective on the Mad King's War, because though the good guys won, that's not how the people of Dane see it, who are now occupied by a foreign power and living in a squalor. Makaya holds a lot of contempt for Ike, especially due to Soph idolizing him constantly. And while it's not fair for Makaya to judge someone she's never met, it's an incredibly human response. And personally speaking, I really love her initial characterization, stealing the show the same way swimsuit Dorothea stole my heart and my wallet. She has a strong moral fiber, is willing to sacrifice herself to help save others, and I'm speaking literally because that's one of her abilities, and she's surprisingly feisty when she doesn't agree with someone. Lord Ike, hero of the Crimean Liberation, leader of the Grail Mercenaries, and father of Soth's children. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's a better burn than when Flora was set on fire. I feel a butt coming. But There it is. This just makes it all the more frustrating when the game does her dirty. Makaya is great in part one, but part three takes everything I admired and throws it into a wood chipper. She makes decisions completely out of character, supporting a war she doesn't believe in, and never questioning King Peleus' motives until he offers up his life. All that fire and rebellion she had in part one is gone replaced with Botomir Cog in the system, and is called out constantly from her comrades as to why they're even fighting in the first place. It doesn't help that the game focuses more on Ike as soon as he returns, and Makai is barely present for part 4, since Yune hijacks her to make the plot move forward. It really highlights what a mess Radiant Dawn's narrative is. I'm actually going to disagree with you on that one. I love Makaya in Part 1, and I think she only becomes more interesting throughout Part 3. It's established early on that Makaya fails to think through the consequences of her actions, depending on Soth to get her out of trouble. She just loves her country so much that she finds herself in over her head, and she can't bring herself to disappoint the countrymen that see her as a goddess. She's a very flawed character, and it's those very flaws that make her interesting. Well, Radiant Dawn's writing has always been divisive, to put it lightly. I guess it's nice that we each represent a different side of the debate. But let's talk about something less divisive. Cold Hard Stats! Actually, that's kind of divisive too. Radiant Dawn is branded the hardest Fire Emblem game to be released in the West, and many got frustrated with how flimsy Micaiah is. But, guys, she's a mage. Of course she's flimsy. You gotta protect her. Attack at range. Makaya is a breath of fresh air in terms of abilities when compared to the long list of lords. Her defense and speed are abysmal, meaning any decent melee unit can rip her to shreds, but her magic, resistance, and luck stats are incredible. She can tank mages for days and take a decent chunk of soldiers' HP so long as she has some cover from direct attacks. Once the Tharni Tome is in her possession, Makaya can easily one-shot knights and horses, and turns her into a risky but effective boss killer and a textbook definition of a glass cannon. And when she promotes, she gets staves, making her a clutch healer for the Dawn Brigade. Heck, even before she promotes, the sacrifice ability can let you heal units more likely to take hits, and if you're me, Micaiah heals ally, Laura heals Micaiah, you just doubled your experience input. Alternatively, you can use sacrifice to proc abilities like Wrath and Resolve and go literal ham. There's a lot of fun shenanigans to be had with Dane's Liberator. So it's kind of a mixed bag, but we both love the Silver-Haired Maiden. I just wish the writers loved her as much as we do. As a knight myself, I'm not surprised that Zelkis did all he could to keep her safe. And since neither of them are a fan of the Radiant Hero, I wouldn't put it past Makai to hire him as her retainer from now on. Perhaps now Soph can get around to convincing Ike to father his children. Second question, does Alincia count as a lord? Better question, how come Alincia gets her own spot? I thought we were supposed to be grouping all the characters from the same game. Eh, not exactly. It'll make sense in a moment. Alincia is introduced in Path of Radiance as a non-player version of the Royal Child Escapes Home Country Invasion story. You know, like Marth, Leaf, Roy, Erica. I wouldn't call her a lord in this game, since for the most part she's a plot point. 
but she's a supporting character that I really enjoy. And in the late game, she becomes a fairly useful ally. She's far too fragile to trust in combat. I mean, Ashdown could probably kill every glare hard enough, but it's hard to beat the utility of a flying healer, especially in Path of Radiance where mounts are goddamn broken. But again, not a lord in this game. She ends Path of Radiance being crowned the Queen of Crimea, rightfully so I would say, though many would question if a secret princess who was largely kept separate from the dealings of politics would be fit to rule a kingdom. That's exactly the question Part 2 of Radiant Dawn sets out to answer, making her the main character and, in my opinion, a full-fledged lord. You mean the part with only five chapters in which Alinsi is only playable for two? Semantics! Faced with discontent in her own Senate and the plans of a hostile takeover, Queen Alincia has to prove herself worthy of the throne, and that means more than just fighting. It means delegating to the royal knights, navigating the twists and turns of government intrigue, and eventually, yeah, fighting. And fighting hard. Alincia has one hell of a signature weapon, Amity, which is without exaggeration, a brave sword that can be used an infinite number of times. In Path of Radiance, Alincia lacks the strength to make proper use of it, what's 4 times 0 after all, but I guess she spent the last 3 years doing DBZ styled gravity training, for she returns to Radiant Dawn with a vengeance, starting with a B rank in sword and an A in staffs, and sporting fantastic growth sparring defense and res. Her availability is painfully limited, so by the time she's back in part 4, you might not be able to wipe out enemies with your eyes closed, but again, flying healer with Kanto and staffs. I don't know if the devs consider her a lord seeing as she's not required for the endgame tower, but I always recommend her. Give her a physics staff and you'll never have to worry about how frail she is. Still begs the question, why give her a separate entry from Micaiah? Because someone's trying to hype Radiant Dawn to promote their let's play. <sighs> no! Well okay, maybe a little. But the real reason we combine characters for some entries is because they feel like a set, an ensemble. Erica and Ephraim are largely characterized by their differences to one another. Rowan and Liana by the experience that they share together. But Micaia and Alincia have nothing to do with each other. It's more like Part 1 and Part 2 of Radiant Dawn are each their own tiny Fire Emblem games with their own protagonists. Really tiny in the case of Part 2. But really good in my opinion. Alincia's Gambit is a highlight of the game for me. Both that chapter and the actual Gambit at play throughout Part 2. Seeing her make the hard calls to do what's right, willing to watch Lucia die to uphold justice, and all of it coming back in part 3 when she puts her foot down for Crimea's neutrality by flying in the middle of a battlefield and laying down her sword. That's the type of badass you don't see often in Fire Emblem. Alintia's rise to Queendom is a fantastic little arc that builds off her character in the previous game, and pays off throughout the rest of the story. It's easy to see why her leadership would be controversial to anyone on the outside for not taking a more authoritarian approach to ruling her nation, but we went on that journey with her in Path of Radiance and experienced the war firsthand. Unlike the aristocrats at the table, Alinti has travelled the land with Ike, met people from different walks of life, broken bread with the lagoons that most people fear, and Ike from the very start saw her as an equal and never gave her the special treatment for being a princess either. So when we start Radiant Dawn Part 2 and the aristocrats are giving Alincia a tough time, we instantly side with her. I say screw those guys, they don't know what they're talking about. But Alincia, she takes the high road. She holds her tongue, stays patient, and does her job. She wrestles with self-doubt, certainly, but the way she handles the violent revolution attempt, utilizing the talents of so many disparate characters from the previous game, and putting her life on the line in one of the most grueling yet satisfying chapters in Fire Emblem history, she proves to the Senators and to herself precisely why she belongs on that throne. I particularly like that when Valtome questions her about standing against Benion, Alincia, in the most sophisticated way possible, tells him to kindly fuck off. Kill them with kindness, Alincia. And when that fails, just kill them. The Fire Emblem fanbase tends to use character names for archetypes that reoccur throughout the series. For instance, the Jagan. Named after the character from Shadow Dragon is an early game unit, usually a paladin, given to the player as early as the first chapter, despite being promoted and far surpassing anyone you'll recruit for a while in terms of stats and usability. 
Now, imagine if your Jagan was the main character. My friend, you've just imagined Sigurd. Genealogy of the Holy War may be dated in many areas, but in terms of where the story is willing to go, it's a black sheep for the series in the best way possible. For the first generation, the star of the show is Sigurd, the prince of the Duchy of Chelfi and a paladin of the Granvel Kingdom, strong and stalwart with an unbreakable will to correct any wrongs he sees. This proves to be his greatest strength and the cause of his downfall, as he rushes to a neighbouring country to save a captured friend, only to slowly end up at war with the entire continent. As Sigurd discovers corruption after corruption and fights to take it down, the opportunistic leaders of his own kingdom use Sigurd's victories to assert power and occupy conquered territories, until whoops, Granfell is now an all-powerful empire. It's tragic really, Sigurd is in a way complicit in the empire's rise to domination, but only because he kept doing the right thing. What else was he supposed to do? Let innocent people die? Even when Sigurd begins to suspect something's fishy, he can't not do what he feels is morally righteous, even if it backfires in the long run. This is a far more adult flaw for a hero to have that allows him to remain one of the most poignant protagonists despite a serious lack of screen time. Sigurd's story is something of a Shakespearean tragedy. The wheels of fate are out of his control, and yet, somehow, it feels like everything is his fault as things fall more and more into chaos. All until Arvis betrays him in one of the most brutal scenes I've ever witnessed in a video game. As his friend's treachery dawns on Sigurd, Arvis also reveals Deirdre, Sigurd's wife, who has been brainwashed and now no longer recognizes him, just before Arvis casts Meteor and decimates Sigurd's entire army. My entire army! The one I've been building for five chapters, and the chapters in this game are long! Fortunately, Sigurd's legacy can continue with his son, Selef, but Selef has some big boots to fill. Is he up to the task? Uh, kind of. Yeah, personally, I think Genealogy's plot peaks too early. There's nothing wrong with Selef per se, he's another young lordling with a chip on his shoulder, and if Generation 2 existed in a vacuum, Selef would stand similar to lords like Leaf or Roy. But this isn't a vacuum, is it? We just watched Sigurd, the altruistic champion and badass motherfucker, get brutally massacred alongside his companions and leave a hole in my heart the same way Quan and Eflin got the horse slayer through theirs. Following him up with Selef hurts, not because Selef is naive or weak, but because he's just... Not much of anything. I failed to witness the story characterize Selef beyond the usual avenge my father, reclaim my home business. And we've done that before and better. Because the game spent so much time establishing who his father and home were, witnessing Selef have little to say about it or the unique circumstances of his journey leaves me feeling empty inside. One area where Selef does live up to his father though is in the stats department. Not immediately though. Sigurd has exceptional bases and the best growth of his generation, and he gets a silver sword in Chapter 1 that lets him mow down armies on his own, so long as there aren't too many mages. He's also on a horse, a must-have in Genealogy's Pangean maps. And he starts with Pursuit, the ability that lets you double attack, because apparently that ability is not a given in Jugdral. Selef, meanwhile, starts Swordlocked and Footlocked, which is a serious downgrade, but that's easily remedied thanks to the inheritance system. Based on certain conditions, characters from Gen 1 can pass down equipment and skills to their children in Generation 2. So with some future sight, Selef can ride the fast track train to success. Hell, there's an arena in his intro chapter, so if you wish, Selef can easily surpass his father's legendary strength right from the get-go. Sigurd, even when played casually, is one of the best units in Fire Emblem history. If you could give him all the weapons to use and staple some wings onto his horse, he'd pretty much be perfect. And with a little bit of planning, Selef is his father on steroids, with the potential to outgun Robin, Camilla, Ha, Sheeta, and just about every Jagan. This doesn't exactly excuse Selef's shortcomings as a character, but it is a nice distraction. One that, admittedly, only works if you put in the proper planning, and without that planning, Selef can be sort of terrible. Basically, Sigurd earned himself the number 6 spot all on his own, and Selef is kind of just riding his coattails. But don't let him hear you say that. Fire Emblem Gaiden was a strange sequel to the original Fire Emblem when the series was still figuring out what it wanted to be. 
25 years later, it was beautifully remade for the 3DS as Shadows of Valentia, which is very lucky for its Lords Arm and Celica, who got much deeper storytelling and beautiful redesigns. I want to start out by saying that I really love Valentia's story. After my disappointment with Fates, Valencia reassured me with more of the political detail and interpersonal relationships that I had been missing from the franchise. And again, it's my preference of how to handle a split storyline with two parallel campaigns. Arm and Seneca's stories are largely separate, until Fate forces them together. Think of it as a figure eight, if you will. They knew each other as they were little babies and have an instant connection, but life causes them to become separated. In their teen years, Arm sets out to overthrow the class's rule of Sophia, while Selica embarks on a pilgrimage to investigate what might be wrong with the goddess Miller. They meet briefly in the middle of their journey, mainly get into a really forced fight, and continue their parallel adventures until they coalesce in the game's finale. Of the two, I personally prefer Selica more. Her down-to-earth personality and supports with her fellow acolytes I felt to be far more interesting and engaging. Arm is the voice of reason among his immature friends, and has a level head when assessing military threats, but for the most part, I find him to be more of the standard young boy lord business we've seen plenty of times. Zelika's faith-driven journey really clicks with me, functioning as the supportive centre of her group while remaining brave and steadfast. That's not to say she doesn't have her setbacks, oh no. If you thought Makaya and Erika had it bad when it comes to out-of-character writing, there are times where it feels like Echoes actively hate Selica. Snapping her arm for no reason during their reunion, and that damn Jedi scene gives me other M vibes for how it just bricks our leading lady. <sighs> Still hurts after all these years. But these moments of frustration don't erase her positives. I'm a little more willing to forgive the contrived falling out of these two. I don't think it's all that out of character for Selica, just a little rushed. Oh, big surprise. Oscar's quick to defend the ladies again. Yeah, yeah, I'm a regular white knight. Slay me. Sure, Alm and Selica's conflict could have been prevented if the two slowed down for a moment and actually talked to each other. But that's also true of a lot of video game plots. But we have to remember something really important about these characters. They're teenagers. They're gonna act on their emotions, and after how hard each of them have fought up to this point, I can excuse the tunnel vision a little bit. They each think that their mission is the most important thing in the world because that's all they've been doing for the past several months, as opposed to us, the players, getting to see both points of view in a couple of play sessions. Obligatory? Maybe. Unjustified? I don't think so. It also ties into the game's theme, likening Almond Selica to the gods Duma and Mila. Their continent needs both of them in harmony. You need people who are caring like Selica to uphold peace, but you need people willing to fight like Alm to fix what's wrong with the world. And one more positive point for these characters, I love them in these weird exploratory segments Valencia has. Alm thinking up terrible jokes that make even himself groan, and Selica naming every cat she finds. These two are a couple of dorks, and they deserve all the praise they get. When transitioning over to their stats, each of them are solid units in their own right, though I find Arm to be the superior fighter, functioning as a well-built frontline unit with great bases and higher than normal movement. Arm has access to some amazing weapons, including the Royal Sword and upon promotion, bows, which in Valencia have a much higher range and are generally amazing. Yeah, for anyone getting into Fire Emblem who started with Valencia or Three Houses, archers were not always this good. Selena goes for a more glass cannon build, but struggles to reach Arm's sheer damage output even with her best spells. This is somewhat remedied by the fact that she can provide aid to your teammates as well as attack from rage far earlier than Arm has a chance to, granting her greater versatility at the cost of proficiency. Selica also has supportive spells, which you can never have too many of, especially in this game. Shadows of Valencia adapted the map design of Fire Emblem Gaiden a little too faithfully. You can really see the Famicom in some of these chapters, so kudos to our young heroes for muddling through that crap. As two very different lords, Arm and Selica's tale of divided friendship and star-crossed lovers, along with their sense of grounding and humanity, make me want to see their journey through to the end. It just sucks that they actually have to play the game. Fire Emblem Awakening holds a special place in the hearts of many Fire Emblem fans, and remains one of the most pivotal entries to date. After all, it IS the game that saved the franchise, and introduced what would become the new style of Fire Emblem moving forward. It also started the trend of self-insert avatar characters that I don't really care much for, and it pretty much turned the series into Waifu Emblem. Are you, of all people, going to complain about Waifu Emblem? Because that Lin statue in your room says otherwise. I don't have to explain myself to you. 
Well, according to Article 264993-C, this is an opinion piece. Your job is to literally explain yourself. Well, I can explain this at least. I really do like the first of these Avatar characters, Robin. But it didn't feel right including Robin on this list. They're an Avatar, certainly, but that doesn't make them a Lord character. Unlike Korin, who is both, and I think making that distinction is part of what makes the character dynamics in Awakening fare better. Besides, this game has two great Lords already. Awakening was supposed to be a last-ditch effort for the franchise, and as such, Kron feels like an attempt to blend all the past Lords together. He's got more of a strong older brother feel to him like Ephraim, but just enough inexperience to grow from similar to Roy and Leaf. He's the far-off descendant of Marth and also a father like Sigurd and Ellawood. Krom's initial conflicts and story arc involve his home being caught up in a war that costs him a family member and forces him to take the throne. But unlike other games where this is the start of Krom's journey, this regicide doesn't occur until a third of the way through the game, giving us time to get to know Krom BEFORE shit hits the fan. When we meet him, he's not only the Prince of Yalis, but also the leader of the Shepherds, a homeland force that protects the Elysian people from bandits or, as it so happens, unexpected invasions. Krom is proactive in his people's well-being long before the call to action, and gives off an air of confidence, though with a slight bit of a temper, which is a flaw I admire as it comes from a very relatable place and allows the young lord's room to grow, and something to live up to once his wise and older sister Emrin martyrs herself for her country. Krom's reaction to Emrin's death and the chapter that results from it remains one of my favorite moments in the entire series. It's Krom at his lowest point, showing a side of rage and desperation that we don't get to see from a lot of other lords. His charge against Gangrel is exactly the kind of bloodshed Emrin wished to prevent. But at the same time... Yeah, Krom, I get it. Do what you gotta do. It closes the curtain on Krom the Prince and raises the curtain on Krom the King. There's also a protective and loving nature to Krom that really shines in his interactions with his fellow shepherds. Support conversations with his new bestie Robin, his little sister Lissa, anyone really, they all go a great way toward rounding out his character. And once we get the child units involved, we even see a bit of Sigurd dad energy. As great as Krom is, Lucina is, on a personal level, my favorite lord in the entire series. Running around the first third of the game disguised as Marth with a suspiciously high voice, she soon reveals herself to be Krom's daughter from a dark future, who comes back with a small group to prevent catastrophe. Granted, I've seen enough Doctor Who, Dragon Ball Z, and Steins Gate that the time-based revelation wasn't very shocking, but what impressed me is how well Lucina plays as a survivor of a truly awful situation. Her joy in seeing her parents alive and well, albeit younger than she ever knew them, is mixed with an existential sorrow, knowing that her versions of them are dead. She's been through hell, and her world lies within ruins, but she can still fight to save this new one. She really goes for it too, so much so that she's willing to kill Robin before they can fulfill their role in the apocalypse, which can get even more heart-wrenching because, depending on how you pair people, Robin can be Lucina's mother or husband, which sends the drama into overdrive. Seriously, someone give this girl a hug! And a therapist, I might add. Her trauma lingers in every interaction she has, and I kind of love it. Even in her support conversations, like her telling Inigo why it's so hard for her to smile, it makes the situations where she gets to be a normal person all the more endearing. Like how pairing her up with her sister shows that she's deeply afraid of spiders. I think I have a new favorite kind of character. People from apocalyptic futures who turn out to be hapless dorks in any other setting. So, have I won you over on Awakening? I still have issues with it. Particularly the segmented story structure. But I love its characters. I also haven't replayed it as many times as you have, so why don't you take the stats for this one? Gladly. Since Krom likes to shoot fast and ask questions eventually, it's reassuring that this man is a solid unit with nice bases and growths, a great personal weapon, not to mention access to rapiers, perfect availability, and the dual strike plus skill that lets him dominate the power-up system this game introduces. He's not as good as Robin, or procures the necessity of Frederick in the early game Lunatic, but it helps that he's easy to reclass into a number of roles, such as Paladin and Why Didn't You Pick Paladin? Mars' descendant may be a force to be reckoned with, but he pales in comparison to Mars' identity thief. While well, this blue head beauty comes in ready to go with a parallel falchion and a rapier, which is great for farming the wyverns and cavalry that overpopulate the preceding chapters. She already knows Aether, and like all child units, she's extremely versatile with the inheritance system. Depending on who her mother is, she can access a plethora of classes and skills, 
play your cards right, and she'll easily solo maps for you, and I highly recommend her at the forefront of your Awakening party. I can definitely see why you like her so much, and I'm a big fan too, of her and her father. Now all I need is Darkfly Sumia with Aether Gale Force Lucina by my side, and Grima shall become a complete non-issue regardless of timeline. And now it's finally time for my entirely biased favorite, the Lycian Lords, Lin, Ellawood, and Hector. Blazing Sword, or just Fire Emblem as a GBA cartridge says, was the first game in the franchise to be translated to English, and I, like many, was forced to be introduced to the franchise in this way. I won't lie everyone, I got my nostalgia goggles slapped on tight for this one. Well despite not starting with Blazing Sword, I am of a similar opinion. Fire Emblem Lord Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald versions are fantastic, with the writing of their characters standing the test of time and being almost indescribable. So allow us to describe in detail why they're so good. With Lin presenting an outsider's perspective to Lycian politics, Hector outright avoiding them as much as he can, and Ellawood playing the well-behaved straight man, these three play off of each other in a way that makes each of them shine at their brightest, leaving absolutely no reason to rank them individually. Hector, Ellawood, Ellawood, Hector, Lin. Lin. Oh, you like Hector more than Ellawood? Doesn't everybody? Actually, yeah, pretty much. And I can't blame people for preferring the axe-wielding Macho Man, but I find Ellawood to be underappreciated, being a man of great integrity, able to inspire the best in his comrades and never passing up the chance to offer his enemies redemption. Throughout the course of the game, Ellawood loses two people very close to him in a devastating fashion, one being by his own hand technically, each of which deal him a major emotional blow, and yet he's able to climb out of his despair and do what needs to be done for the greater good. He's what an ideal leader should be in my eyes. Well said. Ellawood is pretty great, but he doesn't hold a candle to Hector for me. It would have been easy to just make Hector the dumb, lifelong friend character to Ellawood and call it a day, similar to Boyd or Vake. They even have a similar rivalry. But not only is he a great bro in Ellawood mode, going ride or die on Ellie's quest to find his father, there's also Hector mode to consider, which shifts things to Hector's perspective, cluing us in on what he's going through. He loves his brash way of doing things, but has to come to terms with the failing health of his older brother, Marques Uther, and the responsibility that will fall on Hector's shoulders soon after. We see Hector go from avoiding this fact, or thinking that he just can't be the kind of ruler that his brother is, to finding emotional strength in his friends, and using that inspiration to lead Ostia in a better direction. And that foreshadowing to his faith in Binding Blade is pretty cool too. But where we can both agree is that Lin is our favorite GBA Lord. I know there's contention regarding Lady Lindis' popularity, as the common complaint revolves around her ladyship feeling uninvolved in the overarching narrative. This is most certainly true, as I can't help but feel Lin's campaign was added at the last minute as an easy-peasy tutorial quest to ease new Western players into Fire Emblem. Granted, it's a very good little story that does wonders for her character, however Ellawood and or Hector mode is the real meat of the matter, and Lin is just kind of along for the ride, not any more involved than your average recruit barring a few scenes of each Lord's respective route. But while her story significance is lacking, the writers did a wonderful job at crafting her interactions to make Lin feel like a pivotal part of the group. And my response is... Yeah, so what if Lin isn't involved in the main plot on a personal level? She already had her main arc. So now, she's here to help Ellawood and Hector through theirs. Lin's time in the fields of Sakae grants her a toughened emotional resilience, and yet also an emotional openness that's clearly not taught to other Lycian nobles, because these boys just can't seem to talk about their feelings without Lin's help. Like this scene, where Hector unable to cry over his dying brother, and Lin holding him from behind and vowing to cry for him. She's the emotional center of the trio. That's her contribution. Unfortunately, the good points end there. There's a reason why these three stooges are stuck in third place, and it has everything to do with stats. Yep, I knew this was coming. On average, Blazing Swords trio are among the weakest of all the Fire Emblem Lords. Not so much Hector. He's pretty solid and one of the only axe-wielding lords in Fire Emblem history in a game full of enemy lancers. He hits like a truck and tanks like a hulk. On average, he may not solo the whole game, but he'll make his presence known and be imperative until the likes of Hawkeye and Geist show up. Ironically, Hector does better in Ellawood mode and vice versa, due to each story's late promotion of the title character. You'll have Hector capped at level 20 way before you can promote him if you're playing in Hector mode. As for Lin and Ellawood... 
Foot locked and sword locked, which in Blazing Sword is a death sentence for a unit's viability. At least Elwood promotes to get a horse and access to lances. Lynn, I mean, I love you, honey, but you're dreadful as a fighter and that bow isn't doing you any favors. This is Blazing Sword, not Free Houses or even Binding Blade for that matter. Arrows are worth spit, and where Ellawood has more strength and defense, and surprisingly good resistance, Lynn puts those points into skill, which is nice I guess, and speed, which she really doesn't need considering most enemies in this game are slow enough to dependably double attack 90% of the time. That doesn't stop me from capping most of her stats on every playthrough because I cannot say no to those legs, but I just have that kind of luck with bad units. Things are made especially crippling if you want to get straight to the good stuff and skip Lin mode, in which case she joins horribly weak and is immediately outclassed by Ellawood, Guy, Raven, and the Cavaliers. Who the heck skips Lin mode? Do you really want the answer to that question? Well, that's their problem. Look, I know she's not great. She's a glass cannon that's light on the cannon. But I really like the Mermiden style of lore that she's got going with high crit potential. And the bow means that she can get behind a wall of units for safe damage. And are these not the best critical animations in series history? All this isn't to say there's no redeeming qualities, just that these setbacks are what prevent us from awarding them anything higher than the bronze medal. The fact of the matter is that while Lin and Ellawood have potential to be powerful, that all comes down to luck and favoritism, which becomes a moot point considering that approach works for every Fire Emblem unit. Trust me, I've been down that road many times. Yeah, I'll grant you that. Plus, Blazing Sword's not that hard anyway. These three are great, especially Lin. Does she deserve the three dozen costume alts in Fire Emblem Heroes? Probably not, but she does deserve all the respect she gets, and so do her brothers in arms. There's a reason all three of them are literal fan favorites. Huh. <sighs> Covering three lords in one entry is exhausting. Yeah, I would not want to do that again. So what game are we covering next? Three houses. Ah, darn it. The most recent game in the main series, besides Engage of course, just so happens to host some of the best heroes. Well, maybe hero is a strong word for some of them, but first, a couple of side notes. Side note one, Byleth. The professor is great, but like Robin, I don't think they apply for lord status. The three royal students, on the other hand, do. Side note 2. Why rank Edelgard, Dimitri, and Claude all together? After all, unlike Erika and Ephraim or the Blazing Trio, the house leaders are decidedly not of the same group and don't even spend that much time together. The choice to put them in one entry is due to the fact that I love these three so much that even if they were separated, they'd just take up spots 2, 3, and 4, and the rankings would go as follows. Dimitri, Claude, Claude Dimitri, Edelgard. Edelgard. Oh, come on! I'm starting to sense a pattern here. Well, regardless of the order, these three are extremely well written. Almost too much for their own good, if you ask me. Like, I almost wish Three Houses had a more linear story so we had time to get to know them in a single playthrough, and they had more time to bounce off of each other. But part of the joy of this game is the attachment you get from choosing your house and your students. And it's not like they don't each have seven amazing classmates to share scenes with. I also admittedly like that there's not a perfect ending mode like Revelations where everyone gets to be happy. On the contrary, who Byleth chooses to teach determines the path these characters take, and throughout the game's various scenarios, we get to see each of the Lordlings at their best and worst. All three leaders are incredibly ambitious, made immediately clear right after the prologue, as each of them see potential in Byleth and try to recruit them towards their cause. But ambition can be a power for both good and evil. Claude is a loose cannon whose jokes about setting the battlefield on fire aren't exactly jokes, and keeps everyone who could possibly understand him at arm's length while having no qualms of stabbing someone in the back. But with Byleth's guidance, he learns to open up and become the compassionate ruler the Leicester Alliance needs and can unify his homeland after years of conflict. Dimitri is haunted by the tragedy of Dusker and goes off the deep end when he finds out about Edelgard's betrayal, but with Byleth by his side, he can climb out of that darkness in order to stop her reign of terror and lead his people as opposed to seeking revenge above all else. As for Edelgard herself, if left to her own devices, her morals are otherwise non-existent and will go so far as to mutilate her entire being so as to see her ideals come to fruition. But if Byleth sticks with her, she'll be able to stop and question her own Pyrrhic method, while still liberating Fodland from an unjust and outdated system of ferocracy. 
It's a shame that only one of these alumni of Garrick Mark can graduate with honours in a single playthrough, but it lends itself to a more realistic outcome and makes the weight of Byleth's decision all the more impactful. I've also been noticing an interesting theme with these three flawed deuteragonists. There's a concept in modern psychology called the Dark Triad, a trio of the three most dangerous personality traits, each distinct from one another but categorized by similar difficulties with empathy and the three lords embody these three traits to a T. Edelgard is the narcissist. After her torturous upbringing and years seething with anger, she's convinced herself that she is the only person capable of writing this continent. Her plans must come to fruition by any means necessary, and no price is too high to pay because there's just no way that she can be wrong about anything. So disgusted with the continent's obsession with crests, she ironically still finds herself superior for the hybrid crest that she was tortured to develop, and yet uses that to justify why no one should care about crests anymore. Her morals fall apart under the lightest scrutiny, but anyone who scrutinizes it is an enemy that needs to die. Dimitri is the psychopath. His mental stability finally cracks during the fall of Garrick Mach, under the weight of a lifetime of trauma and survivor's guilt. He becomes unremorseful and bloodthirsty, unwilling and unable to see anything past his need for vengeance. And finally, Claude is the Machiavellian. He wants to end the dehumanization of his ancestors from Almira outside the borders of Fodlan. It's an admirable goal to be sure, but he's willing to lie, cheat, and steal to achieve it. In the words of Niccolo Machiavelli, the ends justify the means. He's certainly the least evil of the other lords, but at his worst, he's an uncooperative dick who's willing to throw his allies under the bus if it means fulfilling his ambitions, and while it's a bit downplayed in Three Houses, Three Hopes puts that heartless Machiavellian mindset center stage, and it is disturbing. Well, that explains why each of them function as great antagonists, but the same foundations allow them to grow into outstanding heroes. We love characters for their flaws, and seeing each of them rise above these dark places to become Fodlan's savior is awe-inspiring. Your mileage may vary regarding how far you're willing to forgive them for what they do, but they all stem from a place of good intentions. All three of them want to do what they feel is necessary to fix Fodlan, but they each have their own baggage to deal with, and Fodlan is a very corrupt society that requires drastic action to change given that it's under the express control of an evangelic dragon lady. We could go on forever about these three individuals, especially with the release of the aforementioned Three Hopes, which only added even more flavor to this triad of colorful characters. The game is still fairly new though, so we won't go into it here. Just know that if you weren't satisfied with how Three Houses portrays the house leaders, or were annoyed by some of the loose threads, Three Hopes has you covered. There's also a lot to say in terms of their stats, but all you really need to know is that all three of them are incredibly viable units. The power creep in this game is real, no more worrying about foot lock or sword lock. Heck, no one in three houses is anything locked. And all three of them have a fantastic set of stats. Edelgard is the best numerically, but Claude has the highest speed and skill, while Dimitri hits like if Ephraim went Super Saiyan. And I think Claude's Wyvern gives him the best unique class, but honestly, you can just do so much with this game's tutoring system. The sky's the limit, and these three are the best planes in the hangar. What the hell kind of comparison is that? Look, we've talked about 24 different lords at this point, and I'm getting tired. I'm running out of quips here. Well, lucky for you, there's just one left. And through the process of elimination, I think you can guess who it is. Do you want to do the honors? Can I really? Knock yourself out. Okay, then. <clears throat> Prepare yourself. It should come as no surprise that we like Ike. A lot. He may not be either of our personal favourites, given that Lin is Oscar's eternal waifu, and I'm more privy to Lady Lucina, but when weighing everyone's best attributes, it became clear to both of us that Ike would take our number one spot. Due to the perks of being the main character of two mainline games, much like Mark, and his track record of being a total BAMF, Ike carved out his place in the series as one of the franchise's finest and to me, is the dividing line between the GBA era of Fire Emblem and the modern incarnations. Back in my Top 10 Heroes countdown, I remarked how Ike is the only Lord in Fire Emblem without any actual Lordship or Divine Connection. Never is he the secret heir to any throne, and never is anything handed to him to make him the hero based on the circumstances of his birth. 
Well, technically his leadership of the Grilled Mercenaries is handed to him after his father dies, and his incredible swordsmanship comes in part from his daddy being one of the greatest knights in the history of Tellius. He definitely has his own version of his kingdom being destroyed and him having big shoes to fill, but Ike's training from Grail is his starting point, not something that carries him throughout the whole adventure. It's his own choices and moral fiber that domino him into being one of the most important figures in Tellius. It's his decision to stick with Alincia and his open-mindedness to accept the Lagoos, which costs him early on as members of his own group go AWOL immediately afterward, but he stands by his convictions and never takes the easy way out. And he is made the general of Crimea's emancipation effort because he's just the best person for the job. Strong, resilient, and willing to see the best in everyone he recruits. I really enjoy the info conversations in Path of Radiance. The supports cover most of his important relationships, conversing with his tactician, his father's confidant, the princess he's charged to protect, and his guardian liaison. But Path of Radiance also gives Ike moments to just get to know basically everyone you recruit. It's here we get a sense of Ike's no-nonsense attitude and makes him feel far more humble and humane that he's going out of his way to get to know his entire garrison. Like we mentioned with Ellerwood, it's valuable to have a straight man among all these outlandish characters, but Ike manages to be one without his own characteristics being overlooked in favor of some of the more expressive units. He's got no time for bullshit like Gaitry's girl talk and Makalov's excuses, nor can he stand the bureaucracy of politics. Ike is a boorish and straightforward guy, but he's aware of this, and any scene with him and the merchant caravan is pure gold. Fortunately, he trusts his advisors to Tanya and Sorin to keep him from charging into unnecessary danger, and knows that his allies are necessary to help him become the ideal man. On the battlefield, Ike begins much like Roy or Leaf, relying on stronger units to control the battlefield while he scrambles for experience points. Make sure you get him those kills though, and Ike will mature into a force to be reckoned with. For the mid-game at least. Unfortunately, he's another sword-locked, foot-locked unit in the game whose meta revolves around Kanto-happy riders with lances and axes. Ragnar is an amazing weapon, but it's only usable for two chapters. Still, with proper investment, I can be your strongest combatant, especially with the Wrath Resolve combo that obliterates literally everyone. But Ike's true potential doesn't show until three years later. Radiant Dawn Ike. What an absolute unit. While he doesn't have much in terms of character development in the second game, Radiant Dawn takes the hero that he had become, adds three years of CrossFit training, and lets us see him in full legendary hero mode. He sees the political squabbles in Crimea, says screw that, and goes back to his mercenary work, showing up at the end of part 2 for the best goddamn hero moment in series history. He doesn't learn much from his adventure because there's not much left for him to learn. Leave the dynamic character work to the younger leaders like Alencia and Micaiah. Ike's story is just him helping his buddy Ronolf in the Bayork Lagoos War, working with Soren on some amazing stratagems, tying up loose ends with his nemesis the Black Knight, and what else? Oh, nothing special except KILLING A GOD! Radiant Dawn Ike is all the badass of Sigurd without the untimely death, and it's more rewarding because we knew him since he was a little scrub lord, and mechanically, he lives up to his own legend. Having led Crimea's army and going back to the Grail Mercenaries has granted him a substantial buff, starting off with great bases complemented with generous growths and above average stat caps. Surrounded by his team of returning favorites, he still stands out as the best of the cell swords alongside Titania, and he just keeps getting better. For Radiant Dawn is filled with axe users that Ike eats for breakfast, and is able to spend way more time with Ragnar and even promoting to use axes, so he can wield his father's weapon, Urvan, or a Londite after you take it off the Black Knight, just to rub it in. He's not the best unit in the game objectively, but depending on your preference, he's certified third or fourth place, and you have to actively try and get him killed. Having access to Aoife and Nihil allows him to rip part 4 to shreds, the latter skill pretty much being a necessity in this game's final chapters, and Ike is pretty much safe to solo an entire army. And don't worry about the lower resistance, because magic sucks in Radiant Dawn anyway. The biggest compliment I can think to give is that while Fire Emblem's power creep has skyrocketed since Awakening, if you transferred Ike up to three houses, I still think he'd hold his own. And having built him up to attain that level of power, literally from base class level 1, and deserve it, makes him far and away, to us, the best lord in all of Fire Emblem. I'm the Green Scorpion. And I'm Blazing Knight. And we hope you enjoyed this ridiculously long list.
Don't forget to like and subscribe to both our channels and free feel to drop us a comment with your personal rankings. Thank you all for being such good sports and thanks for having me join you for this Green Scorpion. It was an honor to fight by your side. Have a good night everybody.